been continuing to study uh, the book of Acts written by Luke and emphasizing again that it's a continuation really of the gospel of Luke. And uh, some of the things I'd like to note now are, I guess you could put it under the heading of miscellaneous information about the book. Uh, I would recommend anytime you're studying Luke by itself or starting Acts by itself, that you realize that um, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, really is a proper preface to Acts as well as Luke's account. So I would say if you're going to study Luke, of course you would study chapter 1, 1 through 14. But if you're going to start into Acts, I'd recommend that you study the same thing. Uh, I still say there's greater evidence that he intended these two books to be two volumes. I didn't mention this last week, but um, there are even some who say, well, there's the abrupt ending of the book of Acts means he intended a third volume. Well, there's no way to know that. And uh, he may have, but if uh, Paul was caught up and, and uh, put to death because of the persecution of Roman, uh, the Romans had against the church in Rome after the burning of uh, Rome. I think it was 70, what did I say, 74, I believe. Then it may be that Luke was caught up in it too. Nobody knows. But be that as it may, uh, Luke 1, 1 through 14 is, is a good preface to Acts as well as Luke. Um, one thing that's interesting, I don't think I mentioned this, is that uh, in Luke and Acts, you have about a quarter of the whole New Testament. Those two books together comprise about a quarter of the whole New Testament. Uh, one thing, and I don't remember again whether we pointed this out about Luke when we were studying the Gospel of Luke, but Luke uh, takes a lot of time or some time to give prominence to women in the book of Acts. Uh, he did that in the book of Luke, too, and that's where we come across uh, uh, Tabitha, Lydia, uh, Philip's daughters that prophesied. And of course, he also records a husband-wife team, one of them bad, uh, and nice and Sapphira, and then the other one, a good one, Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, so it's interesting that he gives that prominence to women's faithful service in the church and in the uh, following of our Lord in the book of Luke. In uh, the gospel of Luke, studying the life of Christ, we see him come down to the Garden of Gethsemane. We see him go through the crucifixion, we see him raised from the dead, and then when you turn to the book of Acts, you see his ascension, and you see him exalted as Lord and ruler of all, and announced as such just in the second chapter when the church is started. We might note this, too, concerning um, feast days, since we come in Acts 2 to the first Pentecost feast day following the resurrection of Christ. Uh, this was one of three annual Hebrew festivals. And uh, it, it's, if you want to look at the Old Testament references, it's in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 16. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 16. And the feast of Pentecost or that time period, uh, happened each spring 50 days after Passover. And it was a celebration of what's called the first fruits. And it's called the first fruits because winter wheat began to uh, ripen in the spring. And thus they were celebrating that as a feast day as a feast of uh, first fruits of the wheat harvest. And of course, it always occurred on the first day of the week. And 
that helps you understand then when Passover, from Passover, count 50 days forward and you've got Pentecost. And I find it amazing in the providence of God that he could pull all of this together and make it all happen exactly when he did. You have all these Jews gathered, as it says in the book of Acts, for the observance of Passover, and then they would remain, this is sometimes called the Days of Unleavened Bread, and then they would remain for that 50 days pass, uh, following Passover to celebrate the Feast of uh, Pentecost. And God worked all of that in his divine providence to have the death of Christ coming when it did and the church being established when all these Jews out of, use Luke's own words, out of every nation under heaven. He gives a list of, of many of them in Acts 2. We're all gathered there. And thus the gospel would be preached to that great crowd of people as you read them in Acts chapter 2. So I think that's an interesting thing to note how God's infinite wisdom and power can work all those things down to that time. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Well, that covers everything pertaining to man's salvation as to those days and what transpired in them. Um, you know, this should help us remove any anxieties and any worry we have from us. Uh, it's old song that I think was popular in the late fifties or maybe his early sixties. He, he's got the whole world in his hands. Well, that was a secular popular song, but it's so true. Uh, not a sparrow falls. He doesn't know about it in the very hairs of your head are numbered. God is in complete control. May not look like that from us, but he is. And this is just another great example of uh, how he brings everything down to the times he wants it to happen. And it happened. And thus, in our individual living for the Lord and the ups and downs of life, whatever it may be, uh, as we sing sometimes a song, God will take care of you. Um, there's a passage sometimes that's considered to be a difficult passage. And it has to do with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. In the account that we have, and there are three accounts of his conversion, in the account we have in Acts chapter 9 and uh, verse number 7, Acts 9 verse 7, Paul's, Saul at that time's traveling companions, as he was headed for Damascus, uh, heard the voice of Christ when the Lord appeared to Saul. But when you get over to the account of Acts chapter 22, and verse number nine, Acts 22, nine, it plainly says that they did not hear him. You may already know the solution to this, but it's in the Greek, it's quite clear, but we do the same thing today. Husbands and wives are notorious at doing it. I can't hear you. Well, that usually means I heard you very well as far as the sound of your voice. I even know where you are, and I know it's you. And what we really mean is I didn't understand what you said to me. So when you look at Acts uh, 9, 7, they heard a sound. They heard the voice. They didn't understand it. And so when you get to uh, 22, 7, when it says they are 9, they did not hear him. And I didn't understand it. So that's how we even use it today. Um, I say again, the Greek construction makes it very clear, but you don't have to have the Greek to understand that because we, we all do it every day. So what do we say about those people with Paul? They heard the sound of the voice. They didn't understand what it said. Who understood it? The one to whom it was specifically addressed to, Saul of Tarsus. He understood it which means he had to give them direction as to where to take him. And that was where the Lord told him, and he understood it, that he should go, and uh, he would be able to learn what he must do. We also learn something about the, in the book of Acts, about the work that the Lord called the apostles to do, that is, to be witnesses of Christ. 
in chapter 1 and verse 8 of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, before his ascension, of course, ye shall be my witnesses. Well, we've heard this said before, but here's another good place if you're studying with people who don't have a proper understanding of, of a witness, that a witness testifies what he saw, what he heard, in other words, what he experienced through his five senses in being present in such a way is that he could tell what happened. Um, and they were able to do that. They saw him crucified. They saw many things besides his life, uh, so many things about him, but they saw him crucified and they saw him uh, raised from the dead. Um, it's very clear that he appeared not to all men, but he appeared to witnesses chosen by God. Uh, they had eaten and drunk with him after his resurrection. It's declared plainly in chapter 10, verses 39 through 41. Chapter 10, 39 through 41. And it also says they spent many days with him following his resurrection. Chapter 13, verse 31. 13, verse 31. Now, what's interesting is that when Paul is talking about the resurrection and correcting misunderstandings of it, error in the church of Corinth, that in 1 Corinthians 15, he's declaring the fundamentals, the basics, the first principles of the gospel. And he says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Then he goes on as he develops that and points out, verse 4, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained unto this present, the time Paul was writing that. Some are fall asleep, some have died. Then he says, after that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. And then he gets to himself. Last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. That's another interesting time that if you're studying this in the book of Acts, that you could go to that just to see how many people really did see him. Now, he called the apostles and endowed them with the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, Barakletos, or to transliterate it, Paraclete, relationship with the Holy Spirit that they had experienced with Jesus, besides empowering them with uh, miracles and so on. They especially were chosen to do just what they did, and the early church understood that because of what's said by Luke in Acts 2, verse 42. They knew that if they were to understand the will of the Lord for them as members of the church, they'd have to listen and learn from the apostles who were the official ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth. But I think that's interesting about um, the witnesses and what a witness really is. When uh, Jesus is talking to uh, the disciples in Matthew 24 about uh, answering their questions after they had showed him the beautiful uh, buildings connected with the temple, and he said, see, not all these things, not one stone be left on another, shall not be thrown down. They go across the Kidron Valley up on the Mount of Olives, and that jarring statement is still on their mind. So he said, so they say to him, tell us, when shall these things be? And uh, when are you coming? And what will be the sign of your coming? Well, he addresses the first question, as you know, uh, as to signs preceding the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the Jewish economy. Well, in the process of doing that, he says that the gospel shall be preached to all the world as a witness. Of course, that destroys Jehovah's Witnesses and their concept and the misdefinition, their error on the idea of witnesses. 
It, the gospel is a witness. Well, if you read there in 1 Corinthians 15, you'll see why the gospel is a witness. And you say, yeah, but that's a 2,000-year-old book, and those men have been dead 2,000 years. Well, truth is truth is truth and always will be truth. I don't care where it's 5,000 years old or told right now. It's the truth. Uh, George Washington will forever be the first president of the United States. Now, it might be that somebody studying American history 5,000 years from now if the world goes on, and the United States has been gone for 3,000 years or something. But George Washington will still have been the first president of the United States. So it's up to people to disprove that the account and the material in the Bible, especially the New Testament, and what's said in Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is a lie. Because it's certainly not told as a lie. So none but the apostles chosen by Christ specifically were adequately and properly qualified for this crucial role as witnesses of Christ. Nobody else is. The denominations coined the phrase Christian witness. There is no such thing, never has been. It's not speaking as the oracles of God because the apostles of Jesus Christ are the only Jesus called witnesses. That's all there ever was. And so that's uh, simply a made up thing. Uh, I can tell you what God's done for me, and I can be accurate about it. But that doesn't mean that I'm a witness. What do you do to test somebody to see whether they're telling the truth about God, Christ, the Bible, the gospel, how to become a Christian, etc.? You check them out as to what they teach with what the Bible says. So we have the once for all delivered gospel. And we want to be sure that we check everybody out with the gospel. So the gospel, of course, is the apostles' doctrine. If Paul were walking this earth today, he wouldn't teach anything different than what you got him teaching when you read your Bible. I used to get uh, amused at Brother G.K. Wallace. He'd say, people want to see a miracle. Well, they're not going to see one. But he says, I can read you one out of the Bible. And that's exactly what we do. So, yeah, but that was done years ago. Well, if you're going to say that a miracle, before you can believe the Bible in every generation, then you virtually have to say miracles never cease. Because how do I know you're telling the truth unless I work a miracle? But once miracles were worked to confirm the word, which word was revealed from heaven to these men by the Holy Spirit, then they've been confirmed. Are you going to? reconfirm that which was confirmed, and then later re-reconfirm the reconfirm that which was confirmed. I don't know how many re-reads there would be by the time you get out to us from what was confirmed in the New Testament in the first century. A thing confirmed is confirmed. That's all there is to it. There is no more re-reconfirming anything. It's confirmed. It forever remains that way, just like George Washington's first president of the United States. That's done. If I prove that, I prove it. It's just the way that it is. It's the nature of truth. No one today then is an eyewitness, as were the apostles of, of Jesus Christ. And since uh, definite criteria were set down for those who would be his witnesses, which is, is impossible for anybody living today, and since they died, from the time they died to meet, then uh, we cannot be, therefore, witnesses in the sense that they were and were chosen to be and God in his infinite wisdom planned on them being. We can point men to the testimony of the Lord's qualified and appointed witnesses. Now, I've, I've referred to this before, but Paul had to defend his apostleship and you've got in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I've referred to it uh, several times, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul writes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament, defending his apostleship, which also says a person has the right to defend what he teaches, and he has rights right to defend himself. In uh, 
chapter 12 and verse 12 of 2 Corinthians, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Thus, they knew that they were of God to do what the Lord expected his eyewitnesses that he had chosen to do and add the credentials to prove it. And I've often said this when the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation was commended by the Lord himself via the Spirit and through the pen of John for having tried those that say they were apostles and they were not and found them out to be liars. I know one of the ways they could have done it. They could have just said, well, if you're an apostle, as you claim to be, you have the signs or the credentials of an apostle. They didn't have one. They weren't, no matter what they claimed with their mouth. And so they could know whether a person was an apostle of Christ, know in certain terms. That's one reason the church uh, knew when Scripture was being written. They would know these things. As to the design of the book, we have already mentioned that It records the first, uh, what did I say, 32 years or whatever it was, 30 years, maybe 33 years of the expansion of the church from the time it was established until we get Paul into Rome. And um, you can see that it has, uh, first of all, the church in Jerusalem, as you look at the expansion of Christianity, and I think you can divide it. Now, you may do this differently, but just so you can have some sort of systematic approach to it in your own mind, uh, you see it starting in Jerusalem and being spread in Jerusalem in chapter 1, verse 4, through chapter 6, verse 6. Chapter 1, 4, through chapter 6, verse 6. Uh, he closes this expansion in chapter 6, verse 7 chapter 6, verse 7, by saying that the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many priests were obedient to the faith. Uh, it's interesting to note how he says the word of God increased. It meant that it was having influence on people. They were believing it and they were obeying it. That is the power of the word impacted people in their belief and obedience to it. Then you have... Uh, uh, the spread of the gospel outside Jerusalem, you have Judea, you have Galilee, and Samaria. Chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 9, verse 30. And in verse 31 of chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up. And then it says it was multiplied. 931. And then with the apostle to the Gentiles converted, Acts 9, you have the spread of the gospel among the Gentiles with the conversion of Cornelius and his household in Acts 10, verse 1. Uh, and that would cover through chapter 12, verse 28. Expand, that, that carries it through the expansion down to Antioch in Syria with the church established in Antioch. And you have again this statement in chapter 12, verse 24. Chapter 12, 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. And then with uh, Paul involved, with the first uh, preaching tour of Paul, it went into Asia Minor with him and of course with Barnabas chapter 16 verse well it started in, in Acts 13 1 and went through chapter 16 5 and you have in verse 5 of Acts 16 Acts chapter 16 verse 5 so the churches were strengthened in faith and they increased in number daily and then you have uh, the gospel preached in Europe this again was done by Paul Chapter 16, verse 6, through chapter 19, verse 20. 16, verse 6, through 19, verse 20. 
And in verse 20 of chapter 19, it reads, so the word of the Lord grew and prevailed mightily. And then after Paul's arrest and his trip to Rome, uh, he goes to the very hub of a civilized world. Chapter 20, verse 1 through chapter 28, verse 31. Chapter 20, verse number 1 through chapter 28, verse 31. And in verse 31, we see where Paul abode there two whole years. And it says what he was doing, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, none forbidding him. Chapter 28, verse 31. Now, you can break down the book into an outline almost to the point of where you minutely break it down from a little more general to details in the verses. You can do it different ways. I'm not going to do that right now. I will say when you begin the book of Acts, you have, uh, you can break it into two sections. Acts of Peter and the co-workers there in Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter tw through chapter 12, verse 24. And then Acts of Paul and his co-workers in chapter 12, 25 through chapter 28, verse 31. You can say that would just be a, a two major divisions in the book. But then if you break it down a little further, we can say that the prologue to the book of Acts is chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Chapter 1, 1 through 5. And then I would say a rather large division in chapter 1, 6 through chapter 7, 60. Chapter 1, verse 6 through chapter 7, uh, 60 is detailed material of their work in Jerusalem all the way down through the death of Stephen. Now, you can break that down further, covering different verses under that general heading of their work as witnesses there in Jerusalem as the apostles of Christ. But I'm not going to try to do that now because there's different ways of doing it. The way that I originally, years ago, memorized uh, the breakdown of the book. We've done, I, I just did it by chapters. Of course, man put the chapter verses in there, but they had some, at least most of the time, some reason for dividing the book in that way. And since the book's divided that way, then you can learn it by chapters as to what goes on in the chapters. So if you open up chapter 10, you know that that's having to do with the account of the conversion of Cornelius' household. If you know what went on in chapter 11, you know that's Peter's rehearsal of things that happened at the household of Cornelius as he told the Jews about it and um, all that kind of thing. Uh, after their work in Jerusalem, chapter 1, 6 to chapter 7, 60, you can have another main division, and that is their work in Judea and Samaria. I've already went over that as I went through earlier, but you can break down that even further in those passages. That begins in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and goes through chapter 12, verse 25. Acts 8, 1 through chapter 12, 25. And that would be their work as apostles. And remember, we're in the miraculous age, as we discussed earlier. And that would be in Judea and Samaria. And following that, then, of course, they do their work under the uttermost parts of the world. And that begins in chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 28, verse 31. That's 13, verse 1, through chapter 28, 31. This would entail the uh, first journey of Paul and had to do with the beginning of the Judaizing teachers and the conference in Jerusalem in Acts 15. That's how I remembered, as I told you a moment ago, Acts 15, I just think of it as Jerusalem conference. Doesn't mean there are any things found in it, but uh, that's the principal thing about it. And then you have after that the second missionary journey. And following that, you have the third one, 
and then the imprisonment of Paul and his trip to Rome, and that finishes out the book. So you can, uh, you know, you develop these breakdowns because you read every word in the book and you follow through paragraphs and you follow out the breaks and you learn how Luke did what he did, but you can't do any of this if you don't read every word. And so you do that and set it up the way you would like to, and you'd be surprised how if you would have a class of 30 people and they're serious about their study and you were to say to them, uh, outline the book of Acts, you'd be surprised how it would all pretty closely when they turned to their assignment, each one would parallel the other because just the way that Luke laid out the book of Acts, it's very systematic. What else can we do before we finish this? And I think I'll emphasize what I've done in the earlier books uh, before we try to get into Romans and we may run out of time on this, I don't know, but various lessons. You know, ain't no book in the Bible is worth anything to you if you can't draw lessons from it that helps you serve God faithfully. That's the whole intended purpose. Um, the truth of the gospel was revealed almost 2,000 years ago in a culture that doesn't exist today, in a language that hasn't been a living language for multiplicity of years, almost that length of time in a technology that doesn't exist anymore, a society that doesn't exist anymore, but the truth is the truth is the truth. And thus it's up to us in the general study of the rules of hermeneutics and ascertaining the authority of our Lord, which we must, Colossians 3.17, then we must learn how not to drag over that stuff that pertained to their culture or to their technology. But we must be able to ascertain the truth when it was given not long ago in different surroundings, if you want to call it that, from what we're living in today. Always keeping in mind human beings are the same whenever they live on earth as far as how God put them together. So, when we study the Bible, we don't just study it to learn about facts. We have to know those things. When we study it with the intent to make application to our living, which involves our family conduct, it involves our conduct with our fellow man, and so forth. So like the apostles, our vision and our efforts to take the gospel to the whole world, which means the attitude of the church, must begin at home. That's where they began, right there at home in Jerusalem and Judea. And I, when I went back through the outline a while ago, I didn't mention they're just simply following, as Luke lays it out in the book of Acts, the way the Lord said, do it in the first place. Start in Jerusalem, then Judea, then uh, on out to the world after Samaria. So we need to understand that we begin right here at home. People get concerned about uh, reaching all over the place, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's always good to begin at home. The church has always desperately needed preaching that will prick the hearts of the sinner. Acts 2, verse 37. What good is preaching if it doesn't reveal to me what I need to correct in my life? Or it doesn't exhort me to keep on doing what I know that I should be doing. Or it, it in some way shows the errors that exist in the world. That's what the New Testament does. If you remove that from the New Testament, you destroy it. And thus these lessons are much needed. So it needs that kind of preaching and teaching. Now we normally think of that being done from, from the pulpit, but that's because we just have a limited concept of where preaching takes place. Uh, preaching can take place in 
let's put it this way. Preaching is worthless if it doesn't teach. That's what preaching does. It teaches. So in that sense, wherever you are, that becomes your pulpit. And whoever is there for you to persuade becomes your audience. And that's where we are. There's no way the church could have grew and multiplied like we read it was reported to have done, except that people were talking to their neighbors. They were in some way or the other bringing this to their attention. Now, we don't live in any different world than they did as far as hostility to the truth. You couldn't be much more hostile than what you read of in the book of Acts and the persecution brought on Paul and just read the, the list that he gives of the kind of sufferings that he underwent because he spread the gospel. So we need to be mindful that it's our duty to do it. Uh, in other words, they still need to hear the gospel. Faith's formed out of the gospel. They must be moved by that truth to repent and so on. And then, of course, be baptized for the remission of sins. They need to know without doing that, they can't be Christians. There are, just think of the people out there today that think they're Christians. They think they're acceptable to God, but they're not. They're not at all. So there is a sense in which we must save ourselves. That's what Peter, by inspiration of the Spirit, by guidance of the Spirit, told those people on Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 40, Acts 2, 40. Save yourselves was this crooked, or the American Standard translates it, untoward generation. Well, there was a crooked and untoward generation. We certainly have it today. And there is an obligation then, that's what he was saying, on the part of the one who is to be saved, who needs to be saved from his sins, to use what he has that he or she might come to the proper knowledge of the truth and then obey it. So it's not all up to God. It's up to us and God. If you're outside of Christ, you need to hear what he said to do to get into Christ and be saved. So it's a cooperation. And then, too, they announced in the world that believed in many, many, many gods of every description, every kind, that there is but one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, and that's Jesus Christ, chapter 4 and verse 12. Isn't it interesting that denominations can say there's one God and there's one Lord, but they can't say the rest of it. There's one church. That's the reason I like to say there are as many lords acceptable to the Father in heaven as there are churches acceptable. And there are as many churches acceptable to our Father in heaven as there are lords acceptable to him. It works both ways. So if you can see Ephesians 4 saying there's one God and Father and one Lord and so forth, and he says there's one body, and it's clear from Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and Colossians 1, 18, that the body is the church, then 1,500 years before denominationalism ever came up, there was the Lord's church. And since we have the infallible word, and since there's the seed principle, the word of God is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, then when we sow that seed in honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15, then they respond in obedience to the gospel, what's going to be produced? Well, there's going to be Christians, members of the Lord's church. And that's all it can produce. can't produce anything else. Not some sort of hyphenated Christian. Uh, we also need to understand that the church grows in every age, in every day, wherever it is, when Christ is preached. And what all it means to preach Christ. Chapter 5, verse 42 of Acts, I think, makes that quite clear chapter 5 verse 42 so the church still needs also faithful servants of the church everybody can't do all the same thing to the same degree god never intended that uh, to be the case he intended each member of the church to use their several abilities and talents to what they could do and so in acts 6 4 when you have the apostles saying, look, we're the only ones that can do this, and we can't let anything stop us, even though there's a need here that needs to be fulfilled, we can't let that remove us personally for what only we apostles can do. Uh, here are some qualifications 
you find men among yourselves who meet those qualifications, you bring them to us, and we will appoint them over this matter. So it becomes obvious then that God expects everybody to be able to do something, and everybody ought to be willing to do something. Um, when you go back to the days of Moses, God chose Moses as a shadow or type of Christ to be the leader of the Jews. And he had the miraculous credentials that only he could work the works of Moses. And yet you had Korah, Datham, and those characters who wanted to have a say in things as Moses did. And yet Moses reminded them, you have duties God gave you to do. He's the one that assigned you those duties. By his authority, you do them. So why don't you tend to those duties? Remember, everything's to be done decently and in order. I think I mentioned earlier, that's the whole problem with the world. It's not functioning decently and in order as God says it ought to be. And the gospel system will, believed and followed steadfastly, will have everything decently in order. So in the kingdom of the Lord, people have things to do. And we must respect then, care who you are, and if you're truly a Christian, you'll want to, to follow the way the Lord laid out the church to work with elders, deacons, preachers, teachers, each member doing what he can do under the way the Lord organized the church. After all, no man organized the church the way uh, that God did when it comes to qualifications of deacon. No man came up those qualifications, qualifications of elders. No man came up those qualifications. So it must be understood this is God's doings. And I think there are a host of people in the church today who don't have a flea's thimble of knowledge as to the organization of the church and how God intends for it to operate when it comes to the divine organization of it. And thus, they don't mind being like Korah, Dathan, and Byram, and those characters. But God makes it clear how he feels about things like that because they got swallowed up because of their rebellion. And that's used even today, according to Romans 15, 4, as a lesson for us on all things. We are to abide by the authority of the Lord and the way, in this case, he organized the church. There can be people like Cornelius to a degree, not exactly the same, because that was that transition period we talked about last week. But there can be sincere good people out there who don't know any better and they need to hear the gospel, chapter 10, verse 11. And we can learn that from looking at Cornelius. Uh, we're not in the same situation they were then. But nevertheless, there can be people who think they're doing right, they're wanting to do right, but they don't know. And we can certainly, by our efforts to spread the gospel, find those people and God's providential workings of things and then teach them the way. Uh, we also know when Cornelius fell down before Peter, Roman Catholics claim he's the first pope, he said, get up. The pope says, get down. Peter said, get up. So I myself am a man, Acts chapter 10, 25, 26. So we should not elevate men to a position in spiritual things to where we treat them as if uh, they are, as the Roman Catholics call the clergy, the princes of the church. Now, that's just a bunch of malarkey. Or a Roman Catholic church is organized like the Roman Empire. That's exactly the reason it functions like it does. Not organized like the New Testament teaches. And uh, a clergy laity system cannot be found in the New Testament. And uh, we should expose that. We also see that God is no respecter of persons. In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Chapter 10, verse 34. Uh, some people have said, well, you got a problem here. He certainly respected the apostles in view of the work they did and the role they had to perform over those who were not apostles. That's not what this means at all. It means you don't respect personages. It, because a person's a wealthy man or a prominent person, then he, he doesn't have to comply with the plan of salvation but other poor folks do. You can see that working today in our society. Laws are, are upheld, or let's, let's put it this way, they're advocated, 
but then those who advocate them may not think that they need to obey them themselves, but uh, they're too intellectual, high and mighty, but they can sure bind them on everybody else because they're too dumb to know how to come in out of the rain. Well, that's always been a problem among men to elevate himself up higher than he ought to. What this means is everybody everywhere that's accountable to God all have the same gospel to believe and obey. It doesn't make any distinction in race or creed or color or whatever. The gospel is for all, no matter who you are. If you're accountable to God for your actions, you must obey the gospel or be lost. So again, it's all done through words. And um, only by the words of Christ is faith in God in Christ produced, Romans 10, 17. And you can see from chapter 11, verse 14, as Peter rehearses the conversion of Cornelius and his household to the Jews in Jerusalem, that he understood, as did Cornelius, that it would be by words that he would understand the way of salvation. Thus, Paul said, preach the word, be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And so that's the way we still do it today. The word is the seed of the kingdom. Luke 8, 11, plant that word in the heart of an honest and good person, and you will get Christians and Christians only and the only Christians. It won't produce anything else. And we should be content to wear the name Christian. It means of Christ. It's the name that is given in Acts eleven twenty six. 26. Uh, some people said, well, it doesn't make any difference about that. That was given out of derision. There's nothing in that passage that indicates that name was given by persecutors of the church or the members of the church because they derided them. If you see immediately before it was given, you'll see that you had Paul there and you had prophets in the church. And the statement, if you want to do that much study, and the disciples were called Christians first to Antioch. The construction in the Greek language means they were officially by prophecy from heaven recorded as Christians. Now, that's my rendition of that. That's exactly what that means. And if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in his name. So Peter wrote. And then, of course, uh, Christian meaning one who is of Christ. So that's the proper name for every member of the church. No use being called anything else. If you want to, if you want to see people get all confused with the denominational mindset, just keep telling them you're a Christian. Well, what church are you a member of? I'm a Christian. What church are you a member of? One you read about in your New Testament. What kind of Christian are you? I'm not a kind of a Christian. I'm just a Christian. Like it's defined and used in the New Testament. You'll confuse them because they cannot in many cases, get their mind out of the strictures of the denominational box they've been living in for a long time. But it's our job to keep pressing the divine pattern on these things and preaching the gospel to them. We also can see from chapter 12 and verse 5 that earnest, fervent prayer can make a difference. James said so in James 5 that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, it certainly was answered in chapter 12, 5, when Peter had prayer made for him, and he was able to escape. Are we to think that that would have happened if they had been praying for him? It would be ridiculous to say pray when God's not going to answer you anyway. It's just going to happen. Obviously, prayer on behalf of faithful Christians makes a difference with God. Now you say, well, how does it do it? I don't know. That's not up to me to know all that, except God can know all things and does know all things, and there's nothing knowable that he doesn't know. So he can work it all to fit us praying on behalf of somebody else and answer that prayer as he has done and as the scriptures record he did. We might also keep in mind that anybody that begins to array himself as God can end up in sad shape, as did Herod when he was eaten of worms, when he allowed himself to be praised as God, chapter 12, 21 through 23. These things may not happen overnight, but men are going to suffer when they blaspheme God. 
at some point that's going to rise up and bite them and that bite won't go away so we might keep in mind that we need to be so very careful in our proper thoughts toward god letting those thoughts be formed by the bible and how other people deal with god uh, they, we must show the utmost respect and reverence for god in our actions we also should think about the church to Antioch because the scripture is clear in chapter 13, verse 1, that they had some tremendously good teachers there. A church is a great and blessed church when those who are teachers are dedicated, faithful Christians who know the truth and they teach it. And more than that, they know how to teach it on different levels. But the big thing is to know the truth and to teach it. And that's what the church needs if it's going to grow and to develop like an ought to. Then you see that one of the things about the church in Antioch, chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, was that they sent out men to preach the gospel to the world. I said earlier, we began by teaching at home. Well, one of the things about a place like you is that you've got so many people coming from all over the place to Houston. And thus, you can reach no telling how many people, if you try, with the gospel. And they may have come from no telling where originally. And thus we see, though, whatever the case, we ought to be doing all we can to get the gospel out to people. It's just what the church does. It, it, it's like a beating heart. It beats and it moves the blood around and picks up the oxygen in the lungs and keeps the whole body alive. Well, that's what we should be thinking about. It also does a church good to hear reports made back to it by those who have taken the gospel of the lost. You have that in chapter 14, verse 27, when Paul and others came back to Antioch and um, rehearsed those things that happened in, in their preaching tours. There's another thing that so many, at least in my experience, and drawing from the experience of, of others over the years, that brethren just have a hard time handling. And that is when you got problems in the church. Well, if there are problems in the church, it's members causing them. Always has been, always will be. And as one brother told me one time, said you're just getting over problems. Are you in the middle of problems? Are you getting ready for problems? Why do we think the devil's going to leave the blood bought body of Christ alone? when it's faithful in doing the work God called it to do. It'd be ridiculous to think that he would when he's like a roaring lion. He's our adversary. And he goes about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, the best way and the only way that's right in solving those problems is to stay very close with the apostles' doctrine. Look at the apostles. See what they did, chapter 15, 1 through 6. Did you notice, and I've said this several times, let me emphasize it as much as I know how. They did not have that conference in Jerusalem to determine the truth of the gospel as to whether Gentiles should be circumcised to keep the law or whether they didn't have to. They had that conference in Jerusalem to try to find out where the trouble was coming from. Paul had already debated those fellows in Antioch, he knew they were teaching error as an apostle of Christ. He knew it when they said, you Gentiles have to be circumcised and keep the law. Now, this, if anything, says when you know there's problems, try to get to the source of it. Try to find out where it's coming from. One thing that would stand out so clearly to Paul is that these fellows came from Jerusalem. Who down there, in Jer uh, up there, I should say, in Jerusalem? is teaching this. Why did they bring this down here to disturb this church? People either do good or they do bad. 
Now, if a person's not doing good, what is he doing? He's doing bad. If a person's not doing bad, he's doing good. And you say, well, that person's not doing anything. Well, not doing anything's bad. The Christian's to be busy about doing what the Lord authorized him to do. Well, this tells me that when you hear of something, you try to get to the bottom of it. First of all, is it true? That is, that so-and-so said such and such. Well, how do you find that out if you don't go to the source of the problem? So you can come up with all sorts of things that tries to sweep all that under the rug, trying to run from problems, but you won't be solving the problems like God by the apostles said to do it. You can't just operate on hunches and because so-and-so said such and such. If so-and-so is saying such and such, then you need to go try to find out whether so-and-so did say it and then go from there. Well, time's about up. I've got a little longer than usual. Just about 8.30. Thank you for your patience and listening. So I'll stop here and we'll continue on with a few more of these lessons in our next get around. Lord willing. Any questions?